Fronda at Nerdstalker on Twitter, and you are? Social Greg, uh, Greg Vlore, aka Social Greg on Twitter. How you doing, man? Another good, podcast. good. Big week. Big week. Oh, oh, lots oh, of oh. lots of interesting news. Absolutely, we got some doozies here. Let's yeah, talk doozies. about our pa- your Patreon page first. That's right, right. So our Patreon page is uh, check us out, please, and uh, at patreon.com forward slash Nerdstalker. We also have the uh, paypal.me forward slash Feranda. Hopefully, I can change that to Nerdstalker eventually. Uh, we'd appreciate any of your support, donations, whatever. So. Um, Whatever you can spare, we uh, give it our all each week, and we're going to give you all in this episode. Right, Greg? Absolutely. A lot of good stuff here. Wow. Well, let's get started, huh? Uh, Yeah. Joe Rogan podcast really got acquired? Yeah. So this is the big news. Spotify has been buying up, quietly buying up all these different various podcasts, right? And so there's been a lot of worry that they're, uh, well, let's get into this one right now with, with Rogan and his deal. Yeah. Uh, so he recently spoke with uh, Joe Rogan, tells Alex Jones, of all people, that he's going to war against Google and big tech, right? And so thank you to, let's see, Summit News and Steve Watson for this one. Rogan was telling him that he should announce to the world that the move is a direct strike against Google and that the, quote, gloves are off and he is, quote, going to war against big tech tyranny. Uh, The deal suggested to be worth $100 million was announced earlier this week. Analysts are saying that it will change the face of media forever. Uh, Jones said that Rogan wants him to be the first guest on the show, of course. And when it arrives on Spotify on the 1st of September, followed by Elon Musk, who is also currently speaking out against big tech censorship and cancel culture. The last time Jones appeared on the podcast, it was the most listened to podcast of 2019 with over 17 million views on YouTube. Google was subsequently caught shadow banning the episode in an attempt to stop its popularity. Jones said Rogan told him he is sick of uh, being treated poorly by Google and that the straw that broke the camel's back was that Rogan wanted to interview doctors and experts who have a differing opinions on the coronavirus to the officially sanctioned narrative and was told by YouTube that they would not allow such content on their platform. Rogan also noted on his podcast that YouTube is consistently demonetizing his content and removing videos. He told Jones that he is not the is not only as un-American, but also anti-human. I don't know if that read right. Let's see. Rogan has noted on his podcast that YouTube is consistently demonetizing his content and removing videos. He told Jones that he sees it not only as un-American, but also anti-human. Rogan's podcast was downloaded 190 million times per month last year. His YouTube channel has 8.42 million subscribers. And the move away is sure to be a huge strike against big tech thought control is what they say. So um, huge deal, right? With uh, Spotify and the acquisition here. Yeah, it's just, that's wild. I mean, I mean, let's talk about censorship, I guess. I mean, yeah, well, that too, that's yeah. What, that's there's really a, there's what, a few things happening here, right? Yeah, right. I, I mean, obviously, Joe Rogan wanted to put a contrary view out there. I mean, it's kind of like what you you and I do. We we read everything, right? We're right, not in the middle. Right. We read right to left, right, just to get a kind of uh, yeah, a yeah, what's yeah. going on. And yeah, it sounds like um, you know YouTube has become this like network, right? Yeah, Where all yeah. these things they want to play, they could play at that point, right? Well, I've seen I've seen it not only in YouTube too. I've seen it this play out in uh, Twitter and especially Facebook too, that there's been this increasing censorship uh, with anyone that has any, you know, even slightly differing opinion or or wanting to just engage in discussion. And uh, and I think it's the tide is the pendulum is swung a little bit too much in the wrong direction in terms of censorship uh, under the guise and understandably of, uh, you know, uh, public health. Uh, that being said, I think it's important to be able to discuss these things, especially now with the economic downturn and its implications of when, you know, how, how far is too far and, and have these various networks gone too far? I mean, and at the same time, it's controlled by the total capitalistic model we have, right? We, we don't, mm-hmm. you know, I'm doing this because I earn money doing this. 
And if mm-hmm. you, but if you don't like what I'm saying, you're not going to pay me, so I won't have a I have won't have a channel anymore, right? So it's mm-hmm. they're dangling the dollar definitely in front of all these guys, saying that yeah, it's a fake news thing, right? It, it goes both ways, right? Yeah, I mean, I've seen yeah. both ends kind of talk about each other in terms of fake news. And yeah, I'm kind of wondering, like you said, maybe the pendulum has shifted so far over that now anything that's not within a mainstream held view or perceived held view is not going to be run I, wow right. that's really wild man. the crazy thing about this is that these you know everyone keeps forgetting that these three companies and well let's let's say facebook and google are are exceptionally notorious for this uh or youtube i should say um being google uh is that they are privately owned companies so they don't need to abide by any sort of like constitutional rights or anything like that in terms of free speech or whatever so they can do this willy-nilly as they want and i think uh some content creators are realizing their dependency on this and their limit and the limitations of it and so this is uh joe rogan the joe rogan experience was is probably the biggest show in the world period and or one of them for sure and for spotify to get them and with the deal that uh, rogan has outlined i mean he said he gets full creative control no censorship he gets to say whatever he wants he's getting the 100 million outright and uh, it's, uh, he gets basically doing what he's always been doing, and he's getting all that money. And they only have, I believe, is a two- to three-year licensing deal, right, for, for the thing. So he can jump back or, or jump to another network. But uh, I think uh, it's really interesting for other, other content creators and podcasters and, and vloggers alike to, to start considering these things and hedging their bets, right? Because I think a lot of people as of late have been losing money because of a demonetization uh and shadow banning but especially demonetization on uh on youtube yeah i i just uh obviously we don't have to worry about that right now but <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i was about higher. to say greg i want i want spotify to know that we we are to accepting we're offers right we're now available. we're available we are absolutely accepting uh, offers oh, but i i was kind of thinking about like you said there's a couple things going on it's a censorship and the monetization model right it's just you know mm-hmm. i i if like, and I don't know what the licensing looks like with all this. I'm sure when I pl- press that little bo- little checkbox, I agree to all the licensing and has yeah, all that right. stuff in there, right? Yeah, to their terms. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, you know. You, you got to figure, I mean, all these platforms are making money on advertising. Like, like I think as you sort of insinuated there, YouTube, the YouTube ads that they're throwing at you or even the Facebook ads based on the content you're creating and the people that you're drawing in, uh, they're making money on that. Yeah, did you notice as we're watching videos these days, and we're watching a lot since we're indoors, uh, the mm-hmm. pre-roll stuff has increased? Dramatically. Yeah, right. I, I have to wait like now 15 seconds before I get to listen to my podcast. Or right, now. right. Isn't that amazing? Right, as, as well as, I mean, we you know advertise on Anchor too. But um, yeah, within, uh, within the podcast cast itself i've seen people <clears throat> excuse me uh just make it look like it's a conversation all of a sudden there's a a natural flowing conversation though so there's not an obvious sort of stop in the podcast for an ad you know yeah. so it's it's much more slick now it's really wow. really wild that's amazing so basically um Spotify is taking the Vimeo approach to video, right? I mean, Vimeo is oh, is that what like, they do too? Well, Vimeo is kind of like the anti-Google thing, right? Anti-YouTube, mm-hmm. right? Right. All the artists want to go to Vimeo because they don't, they feel that they could have a little bit more freedom, you know, as mm-hmm. right? So I see. You know, it's interesting. Another one of the uh, other concerns too is that uh, other podcasters and podcast. Uh, host creators and podcast platforms are very afraid of this because what Spotify doing is doing is they're sort of vacuuming the big podcasts, right? So the, the, it'll take basically, let's say you're a podcast player application creator, right? And um, now Spotify has all the podcasts, the popular ones, who's going to want to download your app, right? To play podcasts on since Spotify has it all. So, I mean, that's a threat to sort of the open podcast community, which is which has been the power of podcasting, right? That's what's given rise to all these different voices and, and people, even like Joe Rogan himself, right? He started out as an independent sort of video blogger on Justin TV way back in the day when I was on it as well, and other people. And, um, and so it's another concern, I think, from a, a lot of independent developers, application uh, uh, developers, podcast 
creators, any anything within the podcast realm of tech is is uh, potentially threatened by by Spotify. Jeez, yeah, I guess yeah, that's the other level going on is now is is now are, are you know are they going to start to you know get big enough so that they could throw their weight around and kind of control some things, right? I mean, right. Wow. They're the net, they become a network, right? They become, yeah. They are a network. Wow. I guess. Well, I mean, that's that's what we're going to talk about next, too. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, All right, my man. Oh, man. DoorDash. DoorDash. What is this, oh, Greg? Man. Well, DoorDash Pizza Arbitrage shows the Foo Bar. This is pretty effed up, guys. Uh, economics <laughs> and delivery apps. And, you know, Adolfo and I were just talking about uh, Amazon just a little off, off air there. But um, let, let, let me discuss this whole thing uh, for the audio version. I keep on forgetting that we have the audio portion of the podcast. Thank you. Thank sure. you very much. Yes. Considering so, uh, our, our listeners. Yes. Yes. The biggest part of our audience. The biggest part of our audience. Another sign of how fundamentally screwed, thanks to uh, 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 Gizmodo for this, um, the o- economics underlying the app economy are, it's possible to take advantage of exploitive food delivery platform DoorDash's efforts to sign up restaurants without their consent to engage de facto pizza arbitrage, according to a report by Margins. Mm. So our arbitrage is, uh, simply put, purchasing an asset of some kind at a price and simultaneously flipping it at a higher price to someone else. In that case, Margins Ron John Roy wrote, a friend who has a, ran a, a takeout-only pizza restaurant discovered in March 2019 that DoorDash had begun listing his business for delivery without asking. A wow. strong arm tactic that the delivery giant uses to push restaurants into setting up partnerships and then start coughing up fees. Mm. This created all kinds of problems for the uh, pizza person in question, including customers calling to complain about incorrect <laughs> delivery orders or ones that showed up cold without the restaurant even being aware DoorDash was advertising delivery from it. <laughs> from it in the first place. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I That's didn't realize incredible. it was going on. To be exact, according to margins, DoorDash was selling some of the restaurant's specialty pizzas for its base cheese pizza price of $16, a third off the normal price. Wow. Roy said he realized this enabled pizza arbitrage. In theory, the owner of the pizza could order his own pizzas Ad infinitum at sixteen dollars a pop and pocket eight dollars difference. DoorDash paid the restaurant. This wow. test worked, <laughs> according to margins. The owner placed one hundred sixty dollars worth of pizza, and DoorDash delivery worker paid the restaurant two hundred forty dollars on a company credit card, returning wow. an extra eighty dollars to the owner. However, this was reduced to ten dollars after actual accounting for operating expenses and just one dollar in arbitrage for pizza but the solution according to margins was that the owner simply repeated the process but filling the boxes with nothing but dough wow. that increased the net profit to 75 dollars with no actual customer involvement to complain roy wrote that they repeatedly experiments did this several times to see if door torch caught on it did not the pro- this wow. process does not appear to account for tips to the drivers who won't hope were duly compensated. Was this a bit shady? Roy wrote them in the post. Maybe, but fuck DoorDash. As Marge has <laughs> noticed, this illustrates a fundamental and cruel absurdity of the delivery app business far beyond just that it's sort of a shitty mo- business model where it's hard to turn a profit. The mm. biggest players in the field, despite being backed by, to the tunes of billions by investment firms, are all on shaky footing on the outright mm-hmm. you know, and outright hemorrhaging cash. You know, nobody wins and everyone loses in this model, other mm. than investors, executives making a killing off the sky high valuations. So go on here. Margins argued that the only clear path to victory would be to continue this money-burning competition until only one player is left standing. Does that sound familiar in the <laughs> in the delivery yeah, game? Yeah, yeah. Um, after which the winner could jack up prices, something that a class action lawsuit filed in New York last month claims is already occurring. How do you like that, man? 
Wow, that is fascinating. I mean, what the ingenuity of the American capitalists, right? Uh, for the to create this arbitrage in these restaurant owners, <laughs> kudos to them, man. That's that's interesting. Um, but yeah, the delivery model sure is weird. I can't remember who who it is, Grubhub or DoorDash, that uh, Uber is actually trying to to partner with and acquire right now, I believe. And uh, I, I was hearing from Scott Galloway on the Pivot podcast that um, if that occurs, that it effectively is uh, monopolizing the the food delivery industry to one business and how dangerous that is really in terms, especially now, look what happens when you have one single point of failure and, and the price controlling that they can do and the restaurants uh, whose throats they would be holding. Absolutely. Uh, so. I, oh, that was, uh, I think, uh, Grubhub and... Um... Grubhub and, and Uber. Uh, Uber Eats wanted to get Yeah, together. Uber Eats, yeah. So and, Uber, and, yeah. And Grubhub's the biggest. They, they control right. almost like 90% of the delivery market. Incredible. Right, right. You know, because they yeah. bought Seamless a few years ago and, you know, and um, yeah. another one, uh, Eat24, I believe. They, right, they right. Bought. That's and, fascinating, though. I didn't know that they, they were doing that kind of thing to restaurants in terms of discounting their own food. That's incredible. Isn't that crazy? And yeah, then, and then they just hook without them, them even knowing. Yeah, and that's that's, that's the remarkable. Weird part. I don't know who, what brainiac in that came up with that model, but that seems kind of shady and illegal to me. But oh, okay, you know maybe it's a gray area as they found in the in, in the legal books. But you know, I, you know, I deal with all the the merchants down in Japantown, and you know, it's a sixty thirty split in terms of retail um, uh, restaurants and retail. And they, you know, some of them have just given the middle finger to to any of these guys because they just can't make any wow. money. It's like thirty percent. Really? Yeah. Wow. So so it's it's basically like, you know it's like uh, Apple's iTunes right uh, for apps mm -hmm. right. It's thirty um, percent at the end of the day after you mm -hmm. pay out all the fees. You know, just like they showed in that model there, it sounded like it was even worse. And if you go and doing the research I did is that only good restaurants people are saying make ten percent profit. So how does that work? Jeez, right? only ten percent. My yeah, goodness. Right. So how does that work? Oof. Right. And in and in delivery, it's not the same as dine-in. So mm -hmm. you know they've lost a significant volume in this in this shelter-in-place uh, mm -hmm. of of customers. So I, I mean, they're just bleeding. Everyone's bleeding. You know, it sounds like you know the apps are bleeding. It sounds like the restaurants are bleeding. So this is just a messed up, you know, as they say, foo bar model. Yeah, on top of that, too, what I'm hearing is that they also, the Grub Hubs, uh, and who knows who else, I'm sure that they're all doing this, uh, take a bite out of the delivery person's tip. So if you tip online, uh, they're getting a big percentage of that tip. Uh, the driver sometimes sees no, no tip whatsoever, actually. And so the hack around this and what people are suggesting to, to, to do in the meme going around social media is just to tip your driver in cash in hand and don't even tip uh, via the app. So if you're using one of these del food delivery apps or shit, any any delivery sort of online option, tip your driver in cash. I know no one wants to touch each other, so just leave it on the ground outside your house or whatever the hell you want to do. But do not tip via the app because you are screwing your driver or your delivery person that way. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, or I should say the, the, the industry is. And like you said, uh, the industry uh, itself, from what I hear, is a money-losing proposition. All of them, even ride, ride hailing, uh, Lyft and, and Uber. Uh, it's all it's a money burning proposition. We're going to see prices jump for everything soon because they just can't turn a profit. And that's why we're seeing all this consolidation as well is, uh, you know, they want to kill the competition and hopefully ride out this long, long tail effect and hopefully somehow become profitable. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe I, I was considering the other day actually to balance out my online purchases between Amazon and Walmart. And, you know, just just because of this, mm, good this idea. situation that's going along, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I just don't feel comfortable with it. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. I've I've given up pretty much on on the food delivery services now, and I'm actually just going and doing it myself. I'm doing the shopping, picking up my own food now. Uh, I'm comfortable with that at this point. Uh, so it is what it right is. Now. It's not too bad, right? So yeah, yeah. Everyone, may, you know, everyone hopefully is free to make their own choice. So yeah. all right, let's move on. What's up? yeah? What's next here, Tesla? Right. So thanks to Electrek for, for this one, uh, Fred Lambert. Tesla quietly adds bi-directional charging capability for game-changing new features. So 
in the past, I've talked about a company called Asiago out of Canada, and effectively how it impacts us here in Northern California is we've had these rolling blackouts, right? In the summer, which means we get high winds and PG&E can tell a city, a town, a large county that, hey, you're not going to get power for the foreseeable future until we feel comfortable that these winds have died down, the fire danger has subsided due to liability issues of the past of, with uh, fires. Um, in doing so, people have been scrambling to get solar and, and all these things, right? And what Asiago did out of Canada is they realized if you are a Tesla owner, you, you have a big Powerwall battery inside of your car. And you should be able, if your car is powered up to any degree, uh, to be able to run the electricity of your home via this giant battery in your vehicle, in your Tesla. And it was a pretty groundbreaking technology. And this was only maybe last year, really, that it had really come to fruition. And what effectively Tesla has announced here is that they have it ready. Uh, they have it ready to go, uh, that type of technology. So Tesla itself will be offering this kind of thing. Now, how they will be, it's not on right now. It's just ready to become bi-directional. And so what they will do is in a future so software update, if you opt in as a user, you'll be able to use this bi-directional type of uh, offering to power your home essentially, with your car, right? And that would be pretty amazing. And what, what initially what they're talking about is that you'll be able to power the grid when uh, in times of a power need, right? And so, and hopefully what that also translates to is to be able the ability to power your home as a standalone option, because then otherwise, what's the benefit to the end user, right? Another thing, Tesla initially, why they were hesitant to roll out this type of offering was that they were concerned about the cycling of the battery. In, the, in doing this bi-directional stuff, your battery essentially dies quicker. Uh, they've Somehow they've optimized this type of thing so it's not going to be as big of a hit to your battery as they were uh, previously fearing. But um, this is an exciting new uh, step forward for, for Tesla and we'll see when they actually turn this thing on and let people start opting into this option because I think it's a fantastic option for people who want to uh, power their home as in a sort of an emergency situation uh, via their vehicle as opposed to having to uh, purchase another, I believe it's somewhere around the 10 to 12,000 range uh, for the Powerwall battery to have it installed and, and the whole thing in your home. Your your car is effectively that. Wow. Wow. No, that's that's pretty exciting. I mean, you know, unfortunately, it's it's probably going to be only held to Tesla, right? So, you know, you have to, is it the fact that because you know there's a bunch of other EVs and and other other hybrids on the market, you know, but I, I, that, that's 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 kind of a great idea, right? I mean, that'd be well, that'd be great to see if other companies do do that. Um, I think it really comes down to the battery technology, and I, I think Tesla's uh, far ahead in the uh, in the R and D in that space. Uh, hopefully the others will catch up and we'll have competition for this on on different price points you know so yeah. people can I mean, take you know, advantage I of that as the industry evolves i mean i saw the other day on one of the auto blogs ev auto blogs that i read too is that you know they're really close to getting you know solar panel um, cars right that it's an efficiency Ooh, wow. thing mm -hmm. right and so if you think about that, it's kind of like uh, you have your own solar power charging system. If you could put if Tesla could put that on the roof and mm -hmm. then, you know, do it bi directionally. God, that's, that, that's just wild. Why? Yeah, not? so cool. Why not? So cool. Why not? All right. Let's get a solar suit on Greg so he can walk around and charge everyone's homes. <laughs> All right, yes. buddy. What do, you, what do you want to ask me? Five tips for what? Yeah, let's do this. Ask Adolfo. Ask Adolfo. Anyway. Know why we just, I just started decided to do this, but thanks to Harvard Business Review for this. Five tips to reduce screen time while you're working from home, and I'm going to ask you about the five tips, Adolfo, and you can All tell right. me if that makes sense or they're effing nuts. Okay, yeah. so anyway, um, so let's go through this. Um, so to help time management, they say coaching clients maintain and regain energy while been we've been working on ways they can reduce or eliminate technology throughout the day here are a few strategies they have found this way so number one don't default to zoom they're saying that just make the phone call or you know mm. you can't do interactions but i guess they're worrying that people are defaulting to zoom now that it's become the standard right what do you think mm. about that yeah i think i that's efficient for sure uh with bandwidth issues uh that's 
That's a smart thing to do. Phones has always been pretty, pretty rock solid in terms of stability. I prefer, especially, you know, when you get back and we talk about these email threads all the time and how inefficient they can be. I think sometimes when it comes down to it, man, nothing beats a phone call. Just talking to someone, working things out, you know, just uh, get to the point. Phone call, uh, Slack I've been using. Slack yeah. has been the wonderful tool to kind of just get out of that email thing and thread everything in mm -hmm. one category. So, okay. Yeah. Next, number so two. Thumbs up. Limit your meeting time. So they're saying that setting aside blocks of time to get work done is a good idea. So like, let's say 10 to 12, you're going to just do this, and then you can't schedule meetings in there unless it's an emergency, and maybe 1 to 3 or whatever. What do you think about that? I think it's, it's essential. I think everyone should be doing this. I know that's one of the prime tenets, again, of Agile is the daily stand-up, right, which is a 10 to 15 minute uh, no bigger type of meeting that you have. That's why thus it's called a stand up because in the days in the past you were literally standing up. So everyone was too tired to sit down, right? So you want to get this meeting over with. And uh, yeah, so there's that. I know a lot of people simply schedule a, I will only be available for from whatever it is, 11 to 12 or something on Wednesday or Monday through Friday for meetings and that's it. I like that. I like that. Honest answer and great answer. So anyway, number three, choose physical over digital. To counteract the increased time in front of the screen, both on and off the clock, look for ways you could take the low-tech route. The brainstorming for an article, write out your thoughts on paper instead of actually doing it on screen. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, so it's been proven that when you, I'm actually rereading the back of the napkin by, I believe, I forget his name, Dan Rome or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, his book. And uh, well, I had it right here. Um, they show that when you actually do physically draw things and even hold it up at the screen with a piece of paper and how you're trying to articulate a, an idea that it actually resonates and sticks with the mind better than just some numbers uh, on a, you know, numbers on a whatever digital screen. Yeah. I think all my meditations are written down. I don't, I don't do it. I, I mean, I, I went, I went through that phase like mm -hmm. probably all of us did, where we we're saying, "I'm going paperless." Remember that that, mm -hmm. that phrase? I like to go paperless today, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you know, suddenly we're all taking notes on our iPads, our phones, and everything. And like, then then was in, our screen time was even going up, right? So mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, number four. Move as much as possible to counteract fatigue caused by sitting rigidly in front of your computer. Move around as much as you can in between meetings. Take a walk to the kitchen. Refill your water or coffee. Take a quick break. I used to do that in the office. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, for those of us that are hitting that mid-century mark, this becomes increasingly important, right, to g grease the joints, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I think this is imperative. Uh, you, you know, when you're young, you can break all the rules in terms of food and, and being sort of stagnant in terms of your movement and kind of get away with it for a while, but it catches up to you. This is something just everyone – it's essential, you know, yeah. for optimization. In fact, I, I've been – when they take calls and I don't – as they said in the article here, and they don't, you don't need to take notes, I just walk around. You know, mm -hmm. just kind of just yeah. get myself away from the from the mind. Yeah. Okay, number five, the last but not least, take tech-free breaks. Although it may feel more efficient to eat mm -hmm. lunch at your computer, your brain will thank you for taking a break away from the screen. Eat lunch while chatting with your family members in the kitchen. Look out the window, read a physical book like my friend Adolfo does here regularly, and still and. It'll not only give your brain a break, but it also gives you hours of added bonus of perspective. What do you think about that? Again, essential. Yeah, essential to get your mind right um, and to just get grounded and get that vitamin D, you know, walk in the sun. One of the practices in the shelter in place thing that me and my mom, who's been staying with me, uh, do is we try to do a daily walk, right? So somewhere in the day, I, I do. I spend a ton of time. I'm guilty of it, of on, on being on the screen, social media, YouTube, et cetera. And um, I find that getting out and just walking around sometimes when I don't even want to just stepping out and man, it just changes your whole perspective and helps you sort of get grounded and refocused and just improves sort of everything. All right. Ding. 100% for the yeah. All right. Well, thumbs up. Let's go to Let's speed go, Greg. <laughs> All right. So first story, uh, dolphins at popular spot miss the tourists. Well, sort of, right? So thanks to The Hill for this one, Zach Burdick. Uh, caretakers say dolphins at popular spot miss tourists and keep leaving gifts on shore. 
quote unquote gifts. Uh, so dolphins have been frequently Australia's Tin Can Bay, a popular tourist spot, have taken to bringing gifts ashore, apparently missing the visitors who would normally be lined up to feed them before the coronavirus pandemic. The pot of humpback dolphins has brought sponges, barnacle covered bottles, and fragments of coral to Queensland's Barnacle Cafe and Dolphin Feeding in recent weeks, a volunteer told uh, the story. Nothing surprises me uh, more than when these dolphins show up with this stuff, says one of the users. So yeah, super cute. There's uh, pictures of it. We'll uh, post those in a video of uh, these dolphins and they're actually bringing uh, these things and just sort of presenting them. I, I put in my uh, social media feed that do these dolphins are learning to barter essentially, which is super fascinating to me, uh, you know, because they're, they're, hey, where's the food? Here's our, here's our, you know, here's our trade. Where's yours kind of thing. Yeah, dude. Come on. What happened? <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right. Well, these new plant-based bottles degrade in only a year and could herald the end of plastic. Well, thanks to the mind unleashed for this and uh, Elias Marat. Um, it says that uh, we'll be soon drinking soft drinks from uh, all plant bottles if new plans for major beverage manufacturers come to fruition. So under new plans being spearheaded by Danish beer manufacturer Carlsberg and multinational food and beverage titans Coca-Cola and Danone, a new plant-based uh, plastic created from sugars extracted from sustainably grown plants will replace fossil fuel-based plastics, reports The Guardian. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Isn't that cool? Very cool. Very cool. I mean, it'll degrade. I mean, we won't have this ocean thing going on. I mean, oh, my God. There's this... There's this Bioplastic is, is coming, yeah. man. It's a coming. All right. Speed round. Sweet. Speed round. Speed round. <laughs> All right. All right. I'd like to thank the new Atlas for this. Uh, ben Coxworth. SEG tech generates electricity using shadows and light. Uh, when it comes to regular photovoltaic panels, the fewer shadows that are cast upon them, the better, of course, right? An experimental new device, however, actually generates electricity via the contrast between shadows and light on its surface, which is crazy. So this is developed by scientists at the National University of Singapore. The tool is what's known as Shadow Effect Energy Generator, SEG. The current prototype is made up of a flexible, transparent plastic base along with four cells, each of which consists of a thin gold film deposited onto the silicon wafer. These cells are cheaper to produce than comparable silicon solar cells. When the whole SEG is placed either entirely in the light or in a shadow, it generates little, if any, electricity. However, when part of it is exposed to light and part of it's shadowed, a voltage difference occurs between the lit and unlit sections. This difference in turn produces a significant electrical current. In lab tests conducted under partially shadowed indoor lighting, the SEG was able to power small devices such as a digital watch. It performed best when half in light and half in shadow, as this arrangement provided equal areas for charge generation and storage, respectively. In fact, it was twice as efficient as a similar capacity photovoltaic panel in the same conditions. Along with being able to power small gadgets under less than optimal lighting, SEGs could also serve as motion sensors when a moving object casts a shadow across one of the devices it causes a detectable electrical current to be generated. The scientists are now looking into replacing the gold with a cheaper material in order to further reduce the cost of this technology. Very exciting stuff. Oh man, oh man, that's, that's, that's very nerdy. Very nerdy. Yep. Thank you that's so right. much. Speed round. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks to the visual capitalist, you know, I'm glad we're using a lot of these uh, kind of uh, off-brand, non-mainstream media sources, but Zoom is now worth more than the world's seventh biggest airlines. As you know, the during this pandemic, the airlines have been taking a enormous hit. And so they, they released a graphic here that Zoom Communications market cap right now is at $48.78 billion. Can you imagine that? Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, Overshadowing Southwest 14.04 billion, Delta's 12.3 billion, United's paltry 5.87 billion, International Airlines Group 4.11 billion, Lufthansa's 3.87 billion, American Airlines 3.89 billion, and Air France KLM Groups at 2.14 billion, totaling 46.21 billion. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> crazy, crazy. That's every chance. World changes, uh, man. Ah. Overvalued Zoom. Come on. 
I know. I tell you. Well, we were just talking about market cap earlier. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go to tip time. Tip, tip time. time. Tip time. All right. I'm going to do a little attempt to do a little screen share here. Cool. So what I want to talk about is a great little tip here is SEO cheat sheet. So SEO cheat sheet, when it comes to SEO, there are a lot of things you need to consider to keep your website up to date. The tool aims to help you with technical side of on-page SEO and includes a sorted list of best practices. And since uh, he knows that you're a busy person, he tried to implement them in a TLDR way. Uh, and then he tells you how to get a hold of them. So it's nineelements.com forward slash SEO dash cheat dash sheet and we will include the link and all the information so what's cool is you can see or if you're watching here if you're listening what he does is he uh lists on the left hand column all these various html tags various structures and extra information like page speed, uh, page speed uh, featured snippets javascript frameworks etc uh, for instance if you click let's say uh, a title tag it'll tell you exactly how to do it optimally for to get to generate the best seo uh, et cetera, et cetera. They have alt tag information, uh, how you can optimize that kind of stuff and heading tag information, meta description tag info, open graph, and it just goes on and on. It's a super great resource for all of you, which is most of you out there that are interested in optimizing your websites and, and your apps, et cetera. Anything with content on the web in any capacity, check it out. It's uh, nine elements and we will add the link for um, the SEO cheat sheet. Very lovely. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was a great tip time. Oh, tip time. Tip time. Tip time. All right. Well, coming to Google Chrome near you um, is finally letting you Marie Kondo tabs to keep them organized. Thanks to mm. uh, Design Taxi for this. Um, they're going to allow, allow you to, and it's in beta right now. I haven't, I haven't got it myself, but you could color code all your tabs. And, you know, uh, Adolfo gives mm. me a lot of grief about the 10 million tabs I have open. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, yeah, Greg is a, a tab hoarder the, the for tab, sure. The tab whore. The tab, tab hoarder. <laughs> oh, you said, oh, I thought you said whore. But okay. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> hey. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Don't hate the player, hate the game, Greg. <laughs> oh, my God. But anyway, if you right click on the tab, you uh, when you get that feature, you'll be able to color code it and uh, kind of put things in perspective of what goes with what, what emails go with what. I have like. 10 million different uh, persona emails, so I have to like color code all of them. So, anyway, uh, that's Very my cool. tip for this. Yeah, anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. So, speaking of thank you so much, thank you all for listening and watching to this week's uh, nerdstalker.com. You can find us again at nerdstalker.com and all your podcast uh, options as well as Spotify too. So, on YouTube, watch us on uh, nerdstalker TV, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to get a hold of us, um, email me, Adolfo at nerdstalker.com, at nerdstalker on Twitter. How about Greg? How about you? You can get me at uh, socialgreg at nerdstalker.com, or you could just uh, find me on Twitter, make a conversation, friend me, follow me, whatever you want to do, at socialgreg. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching out there. And be careful out there. I have no fear